So good evening, everyone. Welcome to our public talk uh, every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time. We get together to study a chapter of uh, Emmanuel's uh, books, the collection that is called Living Spring. And after a 20 minute talk, we have our virtual passing. So I invite you all to bring a cup of water uh, because that can be blessed during our lecture and you can take it after the passes. Before we start, I would like to say that Chico Xavier here in Portland, Oregon, we are a nonprofit organization. So for all of those who can, we ask you to help us. Uh, we are a group of uh, volunteers and uh, we would appreciate all the help. So before we start with the ch chapter today, uh, it's chapter 27, and this is the verse that we're gonna be studying today. I would like to invite you all to close your eyes, sit comfortably, comfortably and on your chairs. Take a deep breath and be ready to receive. Receive all the blessings that you came here for, knowing that even though we are here together apart, when we combine our thoughts into the same direction, we are connected. Be assured that we are never alone, that all the benefactors are here surrounding us, taking care of us, taking care of our needs, our worries, taking care of our bodies, the spiritual body, but also the physical body. So at this moment, let go. Let go of all the thoughts that you've been carrying on during the day and just be here still. We thank all the benefactors that are here with us tonight. All of the good spirits from Chico Xavier, from the group from Emmanuel, that are always carrying on these studies with us. And with that, we say amen. So today we are talking about chapter 27 of the book, Living Spring, that is called um, Destruction and Misery. And this is a very deep chapter that again, um, Emmanuel got six words, destruction and misery mark their ways. These words come from Paul, they are in the um, Romans chapter six, verse 16. And from these six words, he go deep, very deep and really shake our basis on the way that we see the world and how we live our day by day. So this is how Emmanuel comments on what Paul said. When disciples fail to trust in the master and avoid acting according to the examples that his divine ministry bequeathed to us, preferring the broad pathway of infidelity to their own conscience, they dig deep abysses of destructions and misery wherever they go without even noticing it. So this first paragraph, just kind of a calling our attention of what happens when we lose trust in Jesus, when we decide to go and rebel and go on our own and, you know, the type of suffering that that can cause us and we're going to talk about what does it mean to basically quit and distrust and what it means to really do not follow Jesus right because we are not talking about religious we are not talking 
about, you know, going to a places or, you know, uh, be partying of, uh, uh, participating on masses. Now we are talking about how we live our lives more than anything. And then Emmanuel continues. If the mind is crystallized in idleness, they destroy the goodwill in the hearts of the other workers around them and they restrain their own opportunities to serve. So we see that in each one of the paragraphs that we're gonna read from now on, Emmanuel compares what our bad choices, our bad behavior is doing for us, but for the others too. If they go down the road of negativity, they destroy the tender hopes in the sentiments of those who are just starting out in the faith and they weave a vast net of darkness for themselves. If they transfer their soul to the dark residence of vice, they smother their traveling companions nascent, virtuous, and they acquire heavy debts to be paid in the future. If they give safe harbor to despair, they quench the tenuous light of trust within the soul of their neighbor and they weep in vain under the storm of destructive tears. If they seek refuge, refuge in the cold house of depression, they as asphyxiate the optimism of those who accompany them and they waste the wealth of time on fruitless complaining. The divine advice for the follower of the gospel is to press on, helping, understanding, and serving everybody. Being inactive is to immobilize others and freeze oneself. Being rebellious is to weep one's brothers and sisters and to hurt oneself. To avoid the good is to misguide others and nullify oneself. Unfortunate are those who do not follow the master once they have found him. Because to know Jesus Christ in spirit and yet live far from him is to spread destruction all around us and to retain misery within us. So Paul is using very heavy words, very hard words. Just the, the words that he chose for this verse, which we think in terms of destruction. And then I went to the dictionary to take a look at destruction. Is this, you know, those who cause destruction, pain, moral loss to others. And then misery, that's to bring calamity and ruin. On their ways, wherever they go, their behavior will bring sorrow, destroy virtuous joy and peace of all of those around them. So he's calling out our attention in this very small verse of how our behavior can really change the scenario of our lives, but also the lives of those who surround us. What Emmanuel does is that he usually takes a, a small verse, the six letters, and unveil all the teachings that were behind that paragraph. And he does that with all the books from, from, from the Living Spring collection, making a chapter of each one of the verses. And some of the verses, they pop up much more often. And we know that there are a lot from Paul in the books that um, Emmanuel writes uh, through Chico Xavier. And in this case, Emmanuel is calling us deeply our responsibility, our responsibility to show our faith, to show up in the moments that many of us would just get the purse and run. So as he starts, when disciples fail to trust Jesus and avoid mirroring his examples, and this is the first, the, how he starts the chapter. I'm just using my words. 
So when we lose the trust, and what it means that to lose the trust. When we lose the trust, anything that the person says doesn't have any account for us. There's a disbelief, a lack of faith. We are not interested. We see as untrue, as a lie. So what he says is that when we do not take what Jesus came to tell us as true, what happens? And then he continues. And when we do not mirror Jesus' examples, what happens? The result, as he describes, is to dig deep abysses of destruction and misery wherever we go without even noticing. And we know that life is hard. We are surrounded by hard times these days. We know that there, you know, violence and um, disrespect. We just need to open the phone or watch TV and um, calamities and disasters all over us. And one may come and say, okay, I don't believe that there is a God. Look around us, all the suffering. What about my suffering? Everything that I'm going through, I don't believe in God. God is not, uh, is not taking care of me. He's not looking after me because this is not fair. So every time that this idea kind of passes into our mind, forgetting that planet Earth is governed by the celestial spirit called Jesus, which is the most perfect spirit that have ever incarnated on our planet. When we lost faith that he doesn't care, and we, we think that he doesn't care, about us, he doesn't care about our planet, then we lose the pathway. And that's exactly when we start creating more suffering for each one of us. And the choices that we make with rebellion, with sadness, with fight, with anger, that's gonna impact others, yes. Because when I am empty inside with no optimism, with um, this anger deep inside, it's gonna impact the people that live with me with my impatience, with my intolerance, with my inability to forgive and forget, um, with my depression, with my desire to commit suicide. But it's mostly going to impact me. Everything I do impact others, but first it impact each one of us. And if we have all the, the, the wealth of things that we can choose from, we are responsible for each one of the choices that we make. And sometimes we forget. We think, well, I can eat anything I want. Yes, you can, but is it good for you? No, can, you, can I eat? hot dogs and cheeseburgers every day with fries. Yes, I can. Is it good for me? No. What will be the consequences of doing that? I'm going to get pretty darn sick. You know, I'm, I'm going to alter my body and then, you know, my cholesterol and then my sugar and then everything else would just go downhill. So the same thing happens with our choices, the choices that we make with our thoughts that we make every day in our lives. Because every time that we choose something, we are not choosing others. When we choose to be here, this choice has some consequences. When I choose not to pray or not to believe, immediately, immediately, I carve the consequences of that. We know that the mind is connected to the body. And more and more science is seeing that. And we heard that from the, the Hindus, from the Rishis 5,000 5, years ago um, from Hinduism. But only now we are paying more attention how we train by training our 
brain, our mind, we can calm ourselves. We can reduce, you know, the amount of, you know, speed that my, how my heart is, is going through. I can heal my body. Um, so the mind has immense powers that we, as incarnated, do not know yet. So Emmanuel continues, if the mind is crystallized in idleness, and in idleness, the idleness is that inertia, is that the place that's not producing anything good. They destroy the goodwill in the hearts of the other workers around them, and they restrain their own opportunities to serve. So idleness, this laziness, this indolescence is a disrespect to the privilege that I have of time. And we know that one of the divine laws is labor law. It's the importance of us create something positive, positive for us, but as we just said, just saw a few minutes ago, as we create something positive for us, we are creating for others too. And the opposite is also, also true. So according to the dictionary, this laziness, this state of inaction, inactivity, so it's not producing something positive, can bring us, uh, can destroy the goodwill in the hearts of the other workers around us and also restrain us the opportunity to serve. And many of us have lived that in our day-to-day lives in our professions. I remember working for the government in Brazil a long time ago, where there was the people who worked at, I was very young, just off, I was still at the college, was a residence uh, doing um, my internship over there. And it was funny because I had all that passion, all the desire to work and suddenly everybody there was in that very slow pace and not interested in producing anything. And, and it's funny how that aura, that energy basically fills the entire environment and everybody starts to behave that way. On the other hand, uh, when we are in a immersed in a, an environment where people are dynamic, where they, they are positive and they are optimistic and they want to produce nice things, nice things. We see that we get engaged much more and we produce much more good things. Today, it's very easy to get idle and it's very easy to lose our at the hand of our, our power to control our minds, our time, our lives. And we see that with the kids, with games, with Discord. We see ourselves with chats, with social media, that suddenly uh, we, we are tired. We want to basically shut off a little bit from the day-to-day -day activities and relax. And we rely into something that it's not actually relaxing at all. That it's proven that if I decide to spend a lot of time in front of the screen on social media, I'm gonna end feeling more tired and less well than I started. So why we do that? Why are we going back to the habit, this habit that is, is um, so engraved in our society and um, so addictive. I was um, talking to someone today and I thought that was very interesting to hear that. They did a research with monkeys and they gave monkeys some iPads and the monkeys got addicted to iPads. So one would not think that monkeys would care about iPads, but the same thing that we see happening with us or happen, happening with our kids, um, can happen, happen to animals too. So the importance of us kind of paying attention, being mindful of how we use our time, 
how we pay attention to what we are doing instead of just kind of following the moment. Then Emmanuel continues about negativity now. He says that negativity destroys the tender hopes in the sentiments of those who are just starting out in the faith. And they weave a vast net of darkness for themselves. So again, negativity having that, that poison that basically can kill any new root that is coming up on people's hearts, but also the negativity being that poison that brings us that darkness into ourselves and making a surface. So another example of negativity is what we are seeing in the news. So yes, we have news on the tip of our fingers. We can hear and watch anything we want at any time. I can have all the beeps and the you know, information, but is it worth it? Is it worth it to listen and to read the same news from five different venues every day? How is that making any good to me or my life? If we pay attention to what we read, we will see that there's more negativity than positivity. So we need to be perseverant, kind of trying to look for things for good content that will increase our optimism, that will increase our faith. So we do not get sick because when I, if I just read about um, difficult things and uh, hardships and suffering, I'm gonna get anxious. I'm gonna get depressed. I'm gonna get sick. I would not be well. Then he talks about vice and debits, debts, heavy debts. And I put this here because we all bring a very heavy filled luggage backpack with vices that we have been building for the past, you know, centuries, millenniums. <coughs> and these vices, they have brought us very heavy debts. And the debts that we have today, these are basically the difficulties that we face when trying to do good things. They are connected to the vices from the past. So it's like a circle. The vices feed us with heavy debts and these heavy debts are ingrained into the vices. So the more debts we have, the deeper the vices and it's harder to get out. So Emmanuel calls our attention to, to how we are behaving every day because these vices, it's not only like smoking or drinking, there are other types of vices too. Vices that are probably as poisonous are those that every day, we continue to do vice of looking at the mirror and not seeing ourselves at, as valuable people, as a valuable person. A vice of gossiping of people we don't like. A vice of uh, being um, having prejudice against others from other cultures, or other skin colors, other religions forgetting that we are all brothers and sisters, that we are all children of the same God. When we do that, it causes despair. We feel anxious, we feel nervous. And then when the, we have the despair, we weep in vain under the storm of destructive tears. And we know that when we are down in that very dark place of despair, and many of us have hit the rock bottom. And usually it's only after we hit the rock bottom that we are able to have the courage to change. But in that moment of despair, 
many of us can make things that we may regret. And they may be very difficult to fix in this life or in the other lives. And just a remind that the way of thoughts that Emmanuel is going, and I'm going kind of a paragraph by paragraph, is showing that every time that we lose trust in Jesus, we may fall into each one of these buckets that we are talking about. Despair being one of them. And I listed here some of the vices that we see every day that are many times tolerated by our society. But we forget that when we go to the other side, when we die, when our body dies, because we don't die, we will continue to have the same vices in the spiritual realm. So the need that I have for alcohol, for drugs, for happy pills, for sexual encounters, for gossiping, I will continue to have those. And Andrea Luis on his books that talk about the spiritual realm, realm. He describes the people in at Umbral suffering all the lack of those needs and basically pursuing us and hanging out with us exactly because they miss their vices or the way to fulfill their vices. So it's important to remember that when we are getting apart from Jesus, we getting closer to other types of spirits. We will always have this invisible witness around us, surrounding us, giving us ideas that not necessarily are good for us. We are living right now a very difficult phase and Divaldo wrote on his books about the planetary transition. Exactly that. So first, when I thought about planetary transition, I was like, yay, yeah, suffering is ending, yay. Yes, it is, but it's gonna take centuries for that to happen. What we are seeing right now is this transition where we are surrounded by multiple natural disasters and difficult diseases and violence and intolerance and moral pain and loss like we have never seen before. So how that can be good? Because what Emmanuel explains and also what Divaldo in his book shows us is that before it gets better, it's going to get worse. So how do I protect myself? We are seeing a pandemic of depression going on right now. So what Emmanuel writes that the depression asphyxiates the optimism of those who accompany them and they waste the wealth of time on fruitless complaining. We are seeing that every day. I was reading um, some numbers at CDC and yesterday talking to my son about mental health. And when we think that about 10% of Americans, and this is from a couple of years ago, are now with depression. And kids, teenagers, young adults are the ones who are suffering more with depression. When we think about those adolescents who are not, are yet to live their whole full life. 
many of them are committing suicide or hurting themselves. So how do we prevent those kids? How do we, can we help ourselves to not go there? So the government does some things, they have some, some treatments, they have the suicide and crisis lifeline that we can reach. But if everything starts with our minds, with our thoughts, how can we protect ourselves from all of this? Emmanuel gives an advice. He says, press on, so continue, help others. Understand, meaning accept what's going on and serve everybody. And that kind of reminded me the conversation from Abigail and Paul from the book, Paul and Stephen, when Paul is really tired and he dreams with Abigail and he's in that moment that he suffered so much that, you know, so much incomprehension from his old friends, from the Christians. I mean, he's just in this place that he's ready to give up. And then she gives him four advices. He says to him to continue to work, to have patience, to learn to forgive. and to help others. So how much of a coincidence is here that is so aligned to what we are seeing Emmanuel is saying? That's basically the antidote to all the suffering that we are living or that we are surrounded nowadays. The answer to all that destruction and misery that we may see around us or inside us that we are creating by not being closer to Jesus, meaning not living by his examples. The antidote is helping, understanding, and serving everything. So in summary, and that's the way that Emmanuel ends this, Unfortunately, are those who do not follow the master once they have found him, because to know Jesus Christ in spirit and yet live far from him is to spread destruction all around us and to retain misery within us. So for us to think about that on the society that we live today, if the government would live by the example of Jesus, having the acceptance, having the compassion, prioritizing those who need more, how that would be different. How will it be different if we look at one another with the same sweet eyes like Jesus looked at us as people who needed help, who people who were in need, and not people to be judged and to be punished. Following Jesus is not a religion. It's a way of life. That's why he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's not carrying a tag, a label, a badge, saying I am from this church or that other church. Trusting Jesus means giving Jesus our lives, letting us, letting him lead us the way, believing that we are never alone and we are always protected. So with that, we're gonna start our virtual passing. And I thank you all for being here.
And in this moment, I invite you to close your eyes, to take a deep breath, knowing that we are not alone. And cross your legs. Leave your open hands with palms facing up. On your thighs. Dear Jesus, we are here. We are here today. To ask for your help, for your love. We are here today to tell you that we trust you. That we want you to hold our hands and lead us the way. Giving us courage, strength, patience, acceptance. So we can renew ourselves into a new person, a better being. Dear Jesus, help us incorporate in our day-to-day -day lives your teachings. Help us implement the love to one another with everyone that we encounter. But above all, help us love ourselves by choosing what is good for us, not for what's good for us now, but what is good for us as eternal spirits. Because we know that sometimes we need to take those sour remedies to fix diseases that were inside us for periods of past lives. Dear Jesus, bless our families, our loved ones. Help us build a home a circle of trusted friends, a network of good spirits so we can all work together, helping one another. Bless our beautiful planet Earth and all those who suffer. Help all those who are lost and in despair because they forgot about you. May hope rise in their hearts, the joy of living and the desire for a better day. Bless up our waters, putting there what we need to feel better and stronger and be with us the entire week. Until next time. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Wish you all a good week.